Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode we will talk about this little box here, the Spark Abacus. This is a monitoring system for the electricity I'm using in my household. And for that I'm using these electricity meters. So we will see how to read the pulses out of these electricity meters and how to connect to these electricity meters using Modbus and RS485. But also how to connect to yet other electricity meters using UART. This is collecting everything and sending everything to the database. This is replacing the Spark counter, which I presented in a previous episode, which was only good for one phase electricity system. This is for three phase electricity system distribution installations. So let's go on. The simplest way to figure out how much energy you're using would be to get an energy meter or an electricity meter like this one. Since I have a three phase installation, I need to use a three phase four wire energy meter. And it's rather simple to use. You put it at the installation of electricity. Here you have L1, L2, L3, the three phases, and neutral, three phase four wires. This is the input, this is the output, and then it will simply display how much energy you're using. So let's test it. So now I've connected the energy meter to the electricity using the wire here, and I've only plugged one of the phases, but that should be enough. And this is the output going to this power plug. So we can have electricity. If I switch it on, you see that it switches on, and if detected that there is a phase or that there is electricity on phase three. And here now I can switch it on, and I can read how much energy I'm using just there. And to have a bit of activity, we need to use some energy. This is why we will use this trusty toaster. It's simply a resistive load, which is using between 710 and 880 watts. Here I've connected the toaster to the power plug output. And if I switch it on, we can see here that we're using around 800 watts. This is on, we still have electricity on phase three. And the interesting part here is the blinking. The blinking tells us that we are using some electricity currently. And it depends on the electricity meter, but this one has 1,600 impulse per kilowatt hour. So every time we have an impulse, we, we could figure out how many kilowatt hour we use. So not only by just reading the LCD, but also by looking at the blinking here. Using the display, a human can see how much energy we've used. But actually, I still wanted to log it somewhere on a computer. So this is not quite useful. We also have the pulse output now. We know that we have 1600 impulses per kilowatt hour. So just by counting the pulses, we can calculate how many, how much energy we used. And to make this machine readable, you can just put a light sensor on the LED and just count the pulses. But I also chose this electricity meter because as you can see on the side here, we have on pin seven and eight, the pulse actually, they call it test, but corresponds to the pulse which we see on the LED with plus and minus. And this way, it's rather easy to connect it to a microcontroller directly and read somehow digital signals out of this electricity meter. So let's connect it to the oscilloscope and see what the pulse looks like. Now I've connected the electricity meter still to electricity, but I've connected two things on the pulse output. On pulse on pin eight, so pulse the plus, the positive side of the pulse, I've connected 3.3 volt coming from this tiny power supply on the back. And on pin seven, the negative side of the pulse, I've connected this tiny resistor. I think this is one kilo ohm. And here on the back we have, so on the end of the resistor, we have the ground where the clip of the oscilloscope is also connected. And then the probe of the oscilloscope is connected to the signal output just coming out of pin seven or the negative pulse. And if I switch on the toaster here to use a bit of electricity, we can see that at every pulse, we, have a, we can see a pulse on the oscilloscope. This is around 93.65 um, milliseconds wide. And since we know that we have one, we have 
1600 impulses per kilowatt hour every pulse means that we used six zero dot six two five watt hours and because of that if we zoom out like this we can see we have to wait a bit until it captures some pulses here when now we have two pulses and these two pulses are separated by 2.93 seconds because we know that between each pulse we've used 0 0.625 to kilowatt hours we can calculate how much energy we're actually using or how much electricity we're actually using and if we make the calculation we arrive around the 700, 774 watts which we're actually seeing here so yeah just based on the output we can calculate how much we're using over time. We just don't know how much we used overall because for that we would read either this value or we would have to store somewhere the value and just add at every pulse 0 0.625625 kilowatt hours. This electricity meter has one disadvantage though. It will show you how much energy you're using but over all three phases and not over single phases one. And in my previous custom electricity meter, I use this electricity meter. And this shows you the energy you're using and the power you're using, but only for a single phase. And since I still have it, I still want to include it in my new electricity meter so I can also monitor how much I'm using on a single phase. This electricity meter is the P-Sphere PZEM004. It's rather simple to use. On one side, you plug power so it can power the device and the device can read the voltage on the AC line. On the other side you connect the current sensing coil so you can measure how much current is going through the load. This is what we see here. Here's the current sensing coil and it measures how much current is going through this wire. So whatever I plug here I can measure the electricity consumption. And the values are displayed here. We have the voltage, the current, the power in watts or kilowatts and the energy in kilowatts hour, which is just the power over time. And I've bought it because it can display all these values, which is rather neat, so you have a fast overview, and it is quite cheap. I think I've bought it for $15. The other reason why I use this one is because it offers a serial port, as you can see on the other side of the device. This is this connector. So using the spark counter, I've connected it to serial, and I could read all these values we could which I could then transmit to my energy monitoring system. The spark counter, my previous energy monitoring system, which I've presented in another episode, uses only one electricity meter. Later I've explained that this is quite fine if you have a single phase electricity distribution installation at your place, but this does not work if you have a three phase electricity distribution installation, like I do in my uh, flat. In this case, you would need one, two, and three electricity meters, one for each phase. But none of them would show me my total power consumption or how much energy I use, simply because each one would only show me the power I'm using or the energy I used for one phase. So I would have to sum up, sum up the three values to get the total. This is why I decided to use this electricity meter which is quite similar. This is actually the PZEM004T and it's quite smaller, but if you look on the inside, that's the inside of the PZ004, you can see it's rather the same thing. It uses the same chip, the SD3004. I think this is where the name comes from. It has also here the ROM to store the values and it offers a serial port, but this one is quite smaller. It just doesn't have all the display but I don't need the display. I just need to read the values out of the serial port and that's it. To read out the values measured by the electricity meter we will use the serial port and in this case I've connected the electricity meter to my computer using a UART to USB converter so I can use the serial protocol to talk with the device. It's safe to connect this the electricity meter to the computer because here there are opto isolators which are electrically isolating mains power from the serial port. So if I enable power, you see that no fuse is blown or everything is fine. The communication protocol is rather easy and I will, we will start simply this small script to show how it works. 
the exchange of message is always seven bytes long. And you can see the first thing I've sent starts with B4. B is for request. 4 sends is the command type to set the address. Then I provide the address C0A80100. And the last byte is simply the checksum. The electricity meter will then reply with A4. A stands for response. 4. This is because I've sent the command type 4. And in the end, you will see again the checksum, which is A0, A4. And here you can guess that the checksum is simply the sum of the previous bytes. After having set the address, I want to read out actually the values which it measured. So I will start with B0, B for request, 0 is to read out the voltage. But again, I'm providing the address from the device I want to read. So again, I'm providing C0, A8, 0, 1, 0, 0. Then there's the checksum. And the electricity meter is happy to reply with the values. So here, instead of 0, 0 in the payload, you will see actually the voltage value, and I've decoded it just below. Um, to have more information about how to decode the values, you can either read the manual, which is provided with the device, or you can go on the wiki. And the same applies for the current, the power, and the energy with command type 1, 2, and 3. The interesting part here though is the address. The address, you have to set it in the beginning and the use interesting the part device here though address is in the request. The address, the address, the device will not set reply. it in the beginning but and the address, the interesting the part here though address is device. the request, so the address, else, the address, the device will not set it in the beginning and the address, the interesting part here though address is the request, the address, the address, the device will not reply. But the interesting part here though address is the request, the address, the address, the device will not reply. But the interesting part here though address is the request. now you will see that the device actually I'm talking not to zero by one instead of my request to one with zero, then I'm will asking see the four the device for the one ending with not one and then the four measurements with the one request ending with two. And I will use one meter per phase. This is why I have three, but you could have as many as you want because you have four bytes of address and that's quite a lot of meters. To be able to connect all three electricity meters to the same UART port, I had to do a small modification though. As you can see here, on the two optocouplers, we have two pull-up resistors. And this is generally the case, so you have a, a clean signal. The issue is that if I connect the three on the same port, we have three pull-up resistors. And this creates some kind of interference on the TX line. So what this transmits and what I, uh, I receive. If I leave the three pull-up resistors, the optocouplers cannot put the signal low enough, so the serial adapter which I have on the computer can actually decode the signal. Um, so what I did is I left the pull-up resistor on the first module, but on the other modules I just removed the pull-up resistor. So now we've seen what the impulse output is on 7.8. Here it is called test, but on other electricity meters you will find it at S0, S0+, plus, S0-, minus. So various kind of designations, but it's actually just the impulse output, which you also see on the LED. Now I was wondering what this is here. So it's, it's written RS486, which I didn't know in the beginning. And when I looked at 15 and 16, the, the ports which are around here, 15 and 16, there's nothing connected to it. And this has to do with the model which I'm using here. I have the DDM100TC, T probably stands for test, the test output, C for coil because it uses coils, so that's a wild guess. And to have this other output, I would need the TCR, R probably for RS485. So I don't have it. Uh, they still printed it because they print everything on the same case, the a generic label on the same case. But I was still wondering what this kind of output is. It seems to be some kind of digital communication. Which, is, which would give more information than just the test output. 
When looking around for an electricity meter which supports or which offers RS-485, I found this little guy. This is the Eastron SDM120. It is an electricity meter and I particularly like it because it's, it's quite small. And if you look at the side, you see single phase power analyzer, so electricity meter, and that's the STM120, which offers Modbus. Modbus uses RS485, so these are two related terms. Um, as you can see, it off also offers pulse output. So there is one at 1000 pulse per kilowatt hour and the other one, which is adjustable. So adjustable means somehow you are able to adjust it and probably you are able to adjust it using the Modbus. So here we can see we have the, t the two outputs, the Pulse 1 and Pulse 2 on the bottom. And on the top, we have other connection A, B, and G. And this corresponds to the RS-485 uh, connection. So we already saw A and B. G probably stands for ground if you want to connect multiple of them. And on the top here, you have a small button and a display to show some parameters. So what is RS-485? Well, it's a serial data transmission protocol defined on the physical level. So to illustrate it, here we have a USB to UART converter. And you probably heard about uh, UART if you're programming, if you're playing with any kind of electronic device. And I've connected it to the oscilloscope. We actually see the traffic here. And what we can see is that it is idle on high and then when it wants to send some data, it goes low for a zero and it is high for a one. Here you see the data bits uh, on top of it, which are decoded from the transmission protocol. And it's one bit after another. This is why it's a serial protocol because it, it's one bit after another. This is UART. This, you can see that the voltage is between zero volts and here 3.3 volt normally, here 3.44 volts. And it is often used to communicate between microcontrollers or be between peripheral on the same board. You might also have already heard about another serial transmission protocol, RS-232, and this is what I have here. It's been used and very present on all the computer and all the devices. Very often you use this connector to talk this protocol. Here I've connected it to your oscilloscope and we can already see that the physical transmission of this serial data is quite a bit different. We still have the same pattern for the zero and the ones, high and low, but the transmission protocol is a bit different. On UART, we had idle high. So high was 3.3 volts or sometimes five volts and low was zero volt. Here we have quite a difference. Here we have idle low and low is not zero volt, low is minus 10 volts. And then we go high if we want to transmit uh, zero, while on the other, high was a one, so it is inverted. And high is not three volt or five volt, here it is 10 volt. UART was thought and it's rather useful if you want to talk between peripherals on the same electronic circuit or electric circuit, so in the same device, in the same peripheral. RS-232, on the other hand, was meant to communicate from one device to another device. And in this case, you have longer cables, and longer cables mean also you will have a degradation of the signal because there is resistance in the cable and also because there is noise coming to the cable. If you have only 0 to 3.3 volts, then with enough degradation quite fast, you won't be able to transmit anything anymore because the receiver will not be able to decode the signal. Now, this is why we have minus 10 volts to plus 10 volts. Here, you need quite a lot of noise for it, for this signal to not be able to decode. So we have minus 10 volt and plus 10 volt. The specification says it's between minus three to minus 12 volt for low and plus three to plus 12 volt for high. So we have quite some margin for decoding this protocol. And this means we can use longer cable. So it's a rather nice and simple protocol if we want to talk between devices. RS-485 is yet another way to send serial data over some cable. So it is a physical communication protocol. Here we have the setup. I again have a USB to serial converter, to UART converter. And this USB to UART converter is connected to this chip, which is which converts the 
UART data to RS485. And here we have the RS485 output connected to the oscilloscope. These are these two lines, A and B, which are connected to the two probes. If you look carefully also, you will see that I didn't connect the leads or the ground of the oscilloscope to any of the circuitry. And this is also why on the oscilloscope we see that A and B are very noisy, because there is no common ground, there can be a lot of noise. The particularity or the benefits of this RS485 protocol is how it works. So what's important or what's not important is what is on your A or line B, because you can see it's very noisy, but it is the difference between both. This is what is in the math function calculated here. The oscilloscope has some trouble calculating it in real time, but the important part is A minus B. This is a differential protocol. This is why we make the difference between A and B. And this is what you can see in um, the math function in purple here. Now, this is zero volt and you can see it is below and above zero volt the same way it is on UART. It is high, idle high, and then it goes low for transmitting zero and high to transmit one. What low is, is everything which is below minus 200 millivolts. What is high is everything which is above plus 200 millivolts. Again, this is a differential signal and what is important is the difference between both. Because it is, because it is differential, because you make the difference, you have some advantages over it. So any noise which is injected on both lines, so the same noise, generally whenever something is, is injected, it is injected on the the two lines at the same time will cancel out when you make the difference. And this electricity meter is some kind of industrial equipment, so it loves talking RS485 because it is very robust against injected noise. On top of RS485, the electricity meter is using Modbus to communicate and to be more precise, the Modbus RTU protocol, because there are other Modbus variants like Modbus IP. In this case, I just opened the document for the STM100, 120, and this defines how the message looks like, gives a brief introduction to Modbus. And when you look at the first page, you already can spot an error here. You have two times the same information in one message. Generally, this doesn't make sense to put it twice, except for error checking, but here we have a separate field for error checking. So you can see that the document has already a mistake on the first page about how the message looked like. And this is already version 2.3, so gives you a hint about the quality. But it still includes the information which we are looking for, where the values are, where the measurements are stored, how can I read out the voltage and so on. So you have a here a brief introduction of Modbus, then how the message looks like, we'll come to it later. And here we come to the important part. So for Modbus allows you to talk to industrial devices which are either there to, um, to, which are connected to sensors. So they read out the measurements and they have measurements and you want to read out the measurements or you want to control some device some valve or some electric switch and so on. So you either read some measurements or you write some configuration or some output. And the communication, the Modbus protocol is only about that, reading or writing values. And this is done in registers. So you want to read measurements from the sensors which are connected to it. These are in input registers. This is where the voltage, the current, and the active power and other measurements are. The other important parts is here we have addresses of the registers. This way we can define, I want to read the voltage, which is at this address, and it will return me a message with four bytes, encoded in float, and this will represent the voltage. Similarly, when you want to, to write something, you don't do it in input registers, you do it in holding registers. This is where you can either output or Actually, in this case, it's to configure the, the device. And for example, you have the meter ID, but you have some other more important information like the bolt rate. And we've seen on the electricity meter that we have two pulses. One is fixed, but on the other one, we can actually set the rate. So how many impulses per kilowatt hour or the other way, how many kilowatt hour per 
impulse uh, output. And this is what we configure in holding registers. Again, for holding registers, we here have the address and then here we see how the format of the value stored on this holding register is. But let's have a look at the messages to read and write these registers. So here we have how to read input registers, the measurements. This is how the message looks like and you can see the first byte is the device address. This way the device knows I have to respond, this message is for me. Then we have the function and function 4 stands for reading input registers. Here we have the address which we've defined previously and then we have the number of points or the number of registers we want to read. Actually a float is stored in two registers. Uh, you, we've seen that it's a float and a float is encoded in 32 bits. In Modbus one register is 16 bit. This is why we need two to read two registers or two points. And then we just have the error checking this is just CSC 16 IBM or CSC 16 Modbus or CSC 16 ANSI. Different name for the same way to calculate the error checking code or the checksum. Once we've sent the address, we will have the response from the device. The device will tell this is my response because this, this is where we have the slave address. Then the function we wanted to read values. So it says here's the response for reading input registers. The number of bytes, this corresponds to what we've asked. We've asked two points. Each point is 16 bits. So it, ma it makes sense. And then we have the four bytes. So these are two points actually. This is the first point and this is the second point or the other way around. And then we have an error checking code. And this is the message or the response for reading registers. Now we can also read holding registers and this is very similar we have the device address but instead of having 04 for reading input registers we have 03 for reading holding registers and the rest of the message is the same the response is accordingly the same we can also write holding registers and this looks a bit different we still have the device id like always the function this time this is 10 the address where we want to write the registers the number of registers, same thing, but here we have a small difference. We tell how many bytes we want to write. This is correlated to how many uh, points we want to write. And then we provide the data and the error check. And that's all there is to it. With that, you know how Modbus works for and how to communicate with this electricity meter. Here, the SDM120 electricity meter is connected to mains electricity, which we see here, and it is powered on. We can see on the display, but there is no current consumption currently. Then this electricity meter is connected to this RS485 to u at converter, which we see the two cables here. This converter is connected to the UART to USB converter, and this way I can talk serially to this electricity meter. On the back, we also see a um, logic analyzer with all the probes on this UART to RS485 converter, so we can see what's really happening on the wire. Here on the left, I will show you the messages by itself, so the Modbus protocol and the messages I'm using, and on the left, we will see, using the logic analyzer output, we will see the physical electrical signal, actually. So. Let's start by enabling the logic analyzer, then running the script. And as we can see, I'm requesting all the messages. So stop the logic analyzer, and now we will have a look at the messages. So as we've seen, nothing more common. I've just asked the device ID 2 and device ID you can read it from the electricity meter just by pressing on the button here a couple of times so this is the volts the amps the watt frequency power factor here ID 002 upside down but there's still ID 002 and if you continue to press here we have the bit rate or the bolt rate which is 9600 and we have no parity. That's it. 
So we know this is device ID 2. This is why I've used also 2 as the slave address. Then 04 to read an input register. Here, this is the address for the import active energy in kilowatt hours. I want to read two registers, and this is the checksum. This is the response with the four bytes, and I'm decoding it at, as this value. And we can do the same for all the other values. If we now look at the logic analyzer, let's go one of the first frames. This. On the top, we have A and B. These are the RS485 um, signals, so you can see that sometimes it's noisy but not why it's communicating, and very often the noise it's, is the same on both devices. These are not too important. What is important is here TX, so this is a transmit from the computer to the converter. And on the converter it is called DI, drive input, because I am driving line A and line B. To enable drive line A, line B, we have the DE line, so drive enable, and it is active high. So whenever I want to talk, I'm activating high, or I'm putting on high the drive enable, and then I can drive line A and line B, so there is no noise on this anymore, and this is the TX um, value. And here we can see the value 0, 2, 0, 4, this is to request, this is the first message to request the voltage. Once I'm finished, I disable drive enable, so I put it low, and at the same time I enable read enable, which is on low, or receive enable. And receive enable means that I'm not driving these A and B lines anymore, so another device can drive them, and in this case the electricity meter will drive them. And on, since I enabled the receive, transceiver, which will do the decode the differential signal, I can on RO, I think receiver enable, receiver output, which is connected to RX on UART, I can receive the bytes, which you can see here, 0, 2, 0, 4, then we have uh, the four bytes, and 1, 2, 3, 4, and here we have the checksum. And this is what RS485 and Modbus look like. Now, one thing took me a lot of time to understand. Here you can see that I'm waiting quite some time before I'm sending the next message. This has to do with the specification. When I first implemented the Modbus protocol, I've sent the next request immediately after receiving the response. But somehow, the electricity meter didn't respond to my second request, but it did to my first, so there was something weird going on. I didn't find any information in the STM120 manual, so I looked around and I found this manual. This is for the STM630, which is actually an electricity meter which already has the three phases, but it's a bit more expensive. And in here you have a quite better Modbus protocol overview, actually. So this tells you just about Modbus protocol. Um, about the Modbus protocol, RTU format, because there's also um, IP version, it uses RS485, and so on and so on. Um, what input register are here, these are the input registers for the STM630, and you can already see that there are a lot more, so there are the three phases, and for each of the phases you have quite some information, more than just what I have on, on the other one. So, yeah, the registers are per device. Um, after that, so these are the then these are the holding registers. We are not interested in that. Here we have some information about RS485. We can see that this the maximum cable length is 1,200 meters, so this is really long. This is quite quite good because you want lots of devices on the same bus, and then you talk to the you have one master talking to the individual devices. And then yeah, again some details, half duplex, so this is what I said, we only have only one device can talk on the bus at one time, and here we can already see we have one master, and on the same bus we have several slaves, but only one master. Here we have A and B terminal again, with this differential signal, troubleshooting, not interesting, one master, lots of slaves, 
the Modbus protocol format, and here you can see that even in this document, which is a bit more extensive, they have the same issue. So I think this is just a copy paste fuck up, but it's uh, it's not good quality. At least there's a lot more information. But the information we want to look at is here, the Modbus protocol message timing. So what I wasn't aware and what I found out here is that uh, in RTU mode, messages start with a silent interval of at least 3.5 characters. And one character is 8 bits, one byte. So one character per byte. So you have to wait at least this long before sending anything. But also, at the end, so following the last transmitted byte, there is at least 3.5 characters which you have to wait before sending the next message. So you have to wait 3.5 characters before, 3.5 characters afterwards, so you have to wait for 7 characters, 7 bytes. For a message which is only 8 bytes long, this is quite a waste of time and uh, the usage of the, the bandwidth is quite low, the usage of the channel is quite low. But, again, this is only about resiliency. Once I've implemented that, I could send several requests to the same device and it was replying. But when I, as soon as I asked for another device on the same bus, this one did respond. And I read further and I read here. You need a silent interval to guarantee successful, successful reception of the next request. So on top of this, or in combination of these 3.5 characters, you need 60 milliseconds of time between messages. Once I've also implemented that, um, then I was able to talk to all the devices and make several uh, m more requests, several requests per time. For my previous custom electricity meter, the Spark counter, I used this development board to connect all devices and do all the processing. This is an Arduino Nano clone and it uses an Atmel Atmega 328P microcontroller. And it was plenty enough to do all the job which was required. You ju I just needed to read the values out of this electricity meter, the PZEM 004T, the 004. I used the serial pole for that. And to transmit the data to my server, I used this radio transceiver. This is a Nordic NRF 24L01+. And yeah, there was nothing more required to, to do this. So this development board was quite sufficient. Now for the Spark Abacus, I will use this development board. This is known as the Blue Pill, and it is based on an STM32F103. This is an ARM Cortex M3 microcontroller, and this is a bit more powerful than this one. So this is an oh, sorry, this is an 8-bit microcontroller running at 20 megahertz. This is a 32-bit microcontroller running at 72 megahertz. So it's quite a boost in processing. But actually, I don't need such powerful processing. All I'm doing is requesting data from devices and then sending back to the server. So this power would be plenty enough. But I was bored from the 8-bit microcontrollers. I found 32-bit microcontrollers a bit more fascinating. And the price is the same. Or oh, this is even can, can come even cheaper than this, this, this. I pay less than $2 for this. So why think about it? The other reason why I use this one is actually the more important reason and why this one wouldn't be suited. On this one, I only have one serial port, which I'm using for the electricity meter. The same serial port is also used for the USB to UART, or the USB port using a USB to UART converter. And this means that you cannot use the serial port for something like requesting data and debugging or doing print of debugging at the same time. And it's quite painful when developing. Now, on this board, I have three UART ports and one USB port. And this USB port is separate from the UART port. It has its own USB stack. This way, I can use the USB port for printf debugging and the three UART ports for the devices because I have to connect three of these PZM0040 using one UART port. So they share the same bus. Then I also need to connect three of these STM120 on the transceiver, but this also uses a UART port. That's the second UART port. And then I'm communicating all the data out using this chip, and this also uses a UART port, but more on that later. 
on top of that, so I need all the three UART ports on that. So sometimes this microcontroller might seem like an overkill because it has a lot of peripherals, but the important part it doesn't it's not that you require all the time all the peripheral, is that when you require some of the peripherals, then you already have them. So it's more to have more it's better to have more peripherals in case you need them actually. And I will also connect this up oh, other way around. This electricity meter, or at least the pulse output, so I pulse output, so I can count the measured electricity. And what's useful here is that it has a different domain which is also running this real-time clock, and it is having backup registers. So I will connect one of these coin cell batteries, and when this device has no power, it will, it will, there will be a separate functionality, set of functionalities, which will only run on this power. It will only refresh, for example, or keep up to date, keep running these registers, backup registers, and this real-time clock. The backup registers, I will use it to count the number of pulses, which have been output here. So as long as there is power, the pulses will keep incrementing, and when there is no power anymore, so probably this also will not give any pulse, then this battery will still be able to keep this data in the microcontroller. This way I don't need an external EEPROM to read all the time or write all the time the, the value, the pulse value, because it, it will be in a register. So this is quite useful. And I won't bore you with the code I'm running on top of it, it will be available on Git and it will simply use all the protocol which I've explained, combining all the data together and then sending it to the server. But if you want to have a look or if you want to check it out, everything is on Git. Once my code running on this microcontroller collected all the data from the various electricity meters, I need to send it to my server so I can store it and I can visualize it later on. On the Spark Abacus, I used this chip. This is the Nordic NRF24 L01. And I wanted to use it, so it was the right opportunity at this time. And it's quite neat. But for the Spark Abacus, I will use another chip. I will use this one. This is an ESP01 module, and it is using the ESP8266 chip. It is quite well known actually in the microcontroller world because it's a very cheap Wi-Fi chip. So this antenna, it's, it's for Wi-Fi, so you can connect to your home network and then you can do whatever you want to it. This is using, or I am not putting some custom code on this chip here. I'm using the out-of-the-box AT firmware and you can talk to it with it using the serial port. This is why I need the third serial port. So I will not bore with you how to run your AT commands and how to open TCP connections to put some data because there are plenty of tutorials with it and there's nothing really hard to, to know or then really challenging. One of the reasons why I use this is because I wanted to play with it. I had it lying around and I didn't do anything. I already know how this one works, but there are also other reasons. This one is really good if you want low power, if you want to do low power things, because Wi-Fi sucks or can suck a lot of power. It needs to always stay on or need to reconnect. This is a very simple protocol and doesn't need a lot of power. So for the embedded world, it's good. It's good, but in this case we have electricity nearby, so I don't need low power devices. I can use these devices which is more power hungry. There's no problem, no issue with that at all. The other reason is that this thing required to have on the other side also a receiver. In this case I use the Raspberry Pi, this is the Raspberry Pi 1. And I need to connect it here, I needed code also running this software and then gathering the data. So, yeah, I needed a second board with some some NRF transceiver on top of it. Also, this um, board now, the Raspberry Pi, is almost broken, not completely. But here, the surface mount micro USB connector. They are very flimsy and this one with a bit, when it shakes a bit or when you have it on the wrong 
angle there will not be power anymore there is kind of a misconnection this is quite the, the usb micro mic the usb micro connectors are well known for this issue so i won't use this board anymore and it's also a very old board i wanted to use something else i will use this board now so this is the orange pi pc and it is a very very cheap single board computer i paid 15 dollars for it so it's even cheaper than this board and it is very powerful but the hardware support is so bad so don't expect to have any hardware or any any of the peripherals working really well or out of the box also for example the graphic accelerator only works on android it doesn't work on linux so if you want to use it as hardware platform really bad if you want to use it as cheap computer really good but don't forget to put a heatsink on top of it to spread all the heat of the cores which are beneath here else you will have issues because it will get warm really easily and it will downscale or it will reduce the frequency of the processor and because the hardware support is good i didn't want to put this chip or use spi on this chip to test if it works in this case i am connecting to my home uh, network using wi-fi and this module will simply be connected to ethernet so it will simply connect this board once it gathers all the data will simple simply open a tcp connection using wi-fi and connect to this device on the database this will be an influx database and you can submit using http some values and that's all it's needed this is the all the reason why i use this now i simply just use network and over network i can directly put the data on my database and on this one then i can visualize the data so collect all the data save them and visualize them now we have all the ingredients to prepare a good spark abacus so we have a three-phase electricity meter this is the base and will give most of the consistency then we have three cheap electricity meters this is just to give a bit of color three quite nice single phase electricity meters this is to give the good taste and don't forget the converter so they can actually mix together then we have a wireless module to give it a nice smell a battery for everlasting fermentation some leds to have a blinking decoration a microcontroller so all the ingredients can mix together so this is the binding element then some fuses and a residual current circuit breaker because we don't want it to overcook we have a case to put everything together inside so it protects the final result and a single pay, single board computer to keep the good taste and to keep the result in memory good souvenirs are ready and now wait until everything is done it is time now to get rid of the legacy spark counter and replace it with the new shiny spark abacus and voila the final installation of the spark abacus here we have the residual current circuit breaker which is protecting from overloading or earth leaks here we have the three phase four wire ddm home 100 tc electricity meter here we have the three sdm 120 electricity meters and this is the spark abacus so as you can see the pulse output of the ddm 100 tc is connected here to the spark abacus we have the three stm120 which are connected using rs485 here again to the spark abacus and here there is also power coming to power the things up and we can see it is working because of the leds red means there is power green blinking means it is running yellow means it is making queries to get the measurements and then blue means it is transmitting the data to the database to be stored actually which is on the orange pi pc and if i connect to it and use the grafana visualization tool i can see the current power power consumption 250 watts i've used 9 kilowatts since i've did the installation 
and here we can also have a look at the power consumption per phase. So currently I'm using only power on one phase. But I can do a lot more statistics because these things are providing a lot more information. And with that, we've completely replaced the Spark counter now with a proper Spark abacus for three phases. You might have noticed that three additional electricity meters are missing, the PZM0040, and actually everything started with them. This is because this is the first prototype of the Spark Abacus. You can see this is the case I've presented in the beginning and everything is quite tightly and neatly packed in this case. Here we have the three PZM0040, the microcontroller, the power supply, the RS-485 transceiver, the Wi-Fi, and here all connections for the coils and the different phases and with the LEDs. The issue with this prototype is just it didn't fit anywhere. It was too large and it wouldn't fit in this case. This is why I had to build a second prototype, this one. And this is the case from an electricity meter, which I got for cheap because it was broken. So I removed all the circuit inside and I've put my spark abacus inside. Except for the PZM, which are in the other devices. I decided not to use them because I already have three electricity meters. So this would be redundant information. And to save space, I just decided not to use them. And it works quite nicely already. When I installed the Spark Abacus, I was looking at the circuit breakers and where they're connected to. So which phase connects to which room or to which plug. And then I discovered this one. This is a bit weird because this one is not connected to any of the residual current circuit breaker here. It is connected directly to phase two. So, and yeah, I don't know. So on the sheet of the electrician, it's written no long. Um, I would have understood if this would be neutral and there would be some kind of ground connection, but this, yeah, I still don't know what it is currently, but luckily this is not connected to anything and I've switched it off. But I'm still wondering what this is actually. Here is the final installation and I'm quite happy with it. But if I would have to redo the or install an electricity meter or do an next version, uh, there are a couple of things I would do the, the same way. For example, I wouldn't use electricity meters with direct connection where you have to rewire everything. Here you can see I rewired the entry to this circuit breaker, then from here it is going to this electricity meters, then from this electricity meter it is going to this one, and then it is going back up to the um, panel with all the circuit breakers. So rewiring everything was a pain. Instead, I would use electricity meters with current sensing coils, like this was in the beginning. And also, I wouldn't use the solid current sensing coils because you still have to um, unplug to put the thing on the wire. I would use here this split core current sensing coils. So you just have to strap it on the wire and that's all you need to do. I will also not use two or three electricity meters. Um, I would simply have one electricity meter which does all the three phases. And for example, like this one, the SDM630. I think there is also a version which uses only coils and no direct connection. This, I think this was for direct connection. And then you just have to have the three phases coming here. So thin wires, really easy to wire, and not the thick wires, and you wouldn't have to use all the thick wires. But I've learned a lot about it, and I did the installation, it works fine, so I will keep it as it is, and just enjoy it.